The Snow Queen in Seven Stories. Seventh story of the Snow Queen's castle and what happened there at last. The walls of the palace were formed of the drifting snow and the windows and doors of the cutting winds. There were more than a hundred holes, all blown together by the snow. The greatest of these extended for several miles. The strong northern light illuminated them all, and how great and empty, how icily cold and shining they all were. Never was merriment there, not even a little bear's ball at which the storm could have played the music, while the bears walked about on their hind legs and showed off their pretty manners. Never a little sport of mouth slapping or bar touch. Never any little coffee gossip among the young lady white foxes. Empty, vast and cold were the halls of the Snow Queen. The northern lights flamed so brightly that one could count them where they stood highest and lowest. In the midst of this immense empty snow hall was a frozen lake which had burst into a thousand pieces. But each piece was like the rest, so that it was a perfect work of art. And in the middle of the lake sat the Snow Queen when she was at home, and then she said that she sat in a mirror of reason, and that this was the only one and the best in the world. Little Kay was quite blue and cold, indeed almost black. But he did not notice it, for she had kissed the cold shudderings away from him, and his heart was like a lump of ice. He dragged a few sharp flat pieces of ice to and fro, joining them together in all kinds of ways, for he wanted to achieve something with them. It was just like when we have little tablets of wood and lay them together to form figures, what we call the Chinese game. Kay also went and laid figures and indeed very artistic ones. That was the icy game of reason. In his eyes, these figures were very remarkable and of the highest importance. That was because of the fragment of glass sticking in his eye. He laid out the figures so that they formed the word, but he could never manage to lay down the word as he wished to have it. The word eternity. And the Snow Queen had said, if you can find out this figure, you shall be your own master, and I will give it the whole world and a new pair of skates. But he could not. Now I'll hasten away to the warm lands, said the Snow Queen. I'll go and look into the black pots. These were the volcanoes, Etna and Vesuvius, as they are called. I shall make them a little white. That's necessary. That will do the grapes and lemons good. And the Snow Queen flew away, and Kay sat quite alone in the great icy hall that was miles in extent, and looked at his pieces of ice, and thought so deeply that cracks were heard inside him. One would have thought that he was frozen. Then it happened that little Gerda stepped through the great gate into the wide hall. Here rain cutting winds, but she prayed a prayer and the winds lay down as if they would have gone to sleep, and she stepped into the great empty cold halls and beheld Kay. And she knew him, and flew to him and embraced him, and held him fast and called out, Kay, dear little Kay, at last I have found you. But he sat quite still, stiff and cold. Then little Gerda wept hot tears that fell upon his breast. They penetrated into his heart. They thawed the lump of ice and consumed the little piece of glass in it. He looked at her and she sang, The roses will fade and pass away, but we, the Christ child, shall see one day. Roses bloom and roses decay, but we, the Christ child, shall see one day. Then Kay burst into tears. He wept so that the splinter of glass came out of his eye. Now he recognized her and cried rejoicingly, Gerda, dear Gerda, where have you been all this time? And where have I been? And he looked all around him, how cold it is here, how large and void. 
and they clung to Gerda, and she laughed and wept for joy. It was so glorious that even the pieces of ice round about danced for joy, and when they were tired and lay down, they formed themselves just into the letters of which the Snow Queen has said that if he found them out, he should be his own master, and she would give him the whole world and a new pair of skates. And Gerda kissed his cheeks, and they became blooming. She kissed his eyes, and they shone like her own. She kissed his hands and feet, and he became well and merry. The Snow Queen might now come home. His letters of release stood written in shining characters of ice. And they took one another by the hand and wandered forth from the great palace of ice. They spoke of the grandmother and of the roses on the roof, and where they went the winds rested and the sun burst forth, and when they came to the bush with the red berries, the reindeer was standing there waiting. It had brought another young reindeer, which gave the children warm milk and kissed them on the mouth. Then they carried Kay and Gerda, first to the Finnish woman, where they warmed themselves thoroughly in the hot room and received instructions for their journey home, and then to the Lapland woman, who had made their new clothes and put their sledge in order. The reindeer and the young one sprang at their side and followed them as far as the boundary of the country. There the first queen sprouted forth, and there they took the leave of the two reindeers and the Lapland woman. Farewell, said all. And the first little birds began to twitter. The forest was decked with green buds, and out of it on a beautiful horse, which Gerda knew, for it was the same that had drawn her golden coach. A young girl came riding, with a shining red cap on her head and a pair of pistols in the holsters. This was the little robber girl, who had grown tired of staying at home and wished to go forth to the north, and if that did not suit her, to some other region. She knew Gerda at once, and Gerda knew her too, and it was a right merry meeting. You are a fine fellow to get about, she said to little Kay. I should like to know if you deserve that one should run to the end of the world after you. But Gerda patted her cheeks and asked after the prince and princess. They have gone to foreign countries, said the robber girl. But the crow, said Gerda. Why, the crow is dead, answered the other. The tame one has become a widow and goes about with an end of a black worsted thread round her leg. She complains most lamentably, but it's all talk. But now tell me how you have fared, and how you caught him. And Gerda and Kay told their story. Snip, snap, snirrupure, basselure, said the robber girl, and she took them both by the hand, and promised that if she ever came through their town, she would come up and pay them a visit. And then she rode away into the wide world. But Gerda and Kay went hand in hand, and as they went it became beautiful spring, with green and with flowers. The church bell sounded, and they recognized the high steeples and the great town. It was the one in which they lived. And they went to the grandmother's door, and up the stairs, and into the room, where everything remained in its usual place. The big clock was going tick-tock, and the hands were turning. But as they went through the rooms, they noticed that they had become grown-up people. The roses out on the roof gutter were blooming in at the open window, and there stood the little children's chairs, and Kay and Gerda sat each upon their own and held each other by the hand. They had forgotten the cold empty splendour at the Snow Queen's like a heavy dream. The grandmother was sitting in God's bright sunshine and read aloud out of the Bible, Except ye become as little children, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. And Kay and Gerda looked into each other's eyes, and all at once they understood the old song. The roses will fade and pass away, but we, the Christ child, shall see one day. They both sat, grown up and yet children, children in heart, and it was summer, warm, delightful summer. <laughs> 